mean, I can get a longer DGA cord from the new one, but that's cool. No, look, I do have an image. So, yeah, so let's. Do you have any black paper? Don't worry about it. Yeah. Oh, maybe closer.
I'm going to go ahead and start. But I'm. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. That's your signal to stop talking. No, I'm just kidding. What a full house. Look at all you people. Thank, thanks for coming. Big hand of applause for yourselves. This is, our, this is our second faculty event this week. It's a, we have a great lineup for you tonight. We're going to hear from writer, poet, and artist extraordinaire Eileen Miles. We're going we're gonna to hear from multidisciplinary artist Ronaldo Wilson. Woo! And we're going to hear from master printmaker Tomas Vu. So big hand for Tomas. Let's see, okay, first a uh, couple of items of housekeeping, et cetera. If you were here last night, I'm sorry, because you're gonna hear it all again, but, um, but maybe you've forgotten. So better safe than sorry. Uh, Ryan, Ronaldo and Eileen's books will be for sale at the back of the room after the event, and they will be available to sign said books, so be sure to check them out after, after the uh, event. Book, books by other members of this year's and other year's faculty are for sale in the bookstore in the gallery, which will be open after the event, so be sure, so be sure to check out the books back there. And also, while you're at it, check out the really great exhibition called Everyone We Know Is Here. It's curated by former Falk fellow Heidi Hahn, and it features work by about 20 former fellows. It's a tremendous show, so if you haven't looked at, looked at it, check it out before you go. Um, big shout out to East End Books for managing our bookstore. <laughs> We're also grateful to Cape Cod Five for their generous support and for our summer program for our public programming this summer. <laughs> the, you guys are following my applause cues very well. I, you guys are a good audience. Um, our bathrooms are still down the hall, on the left. Yay! Thank you. That's awesome. You got to have the bathroom. The sign-up sheet for tomorrow for Thursday's um, student night is over there, and it's filling up nicely. Well done. If you haven't signed up, I strongly encourage you to do so. You will not regret it. I promise. I promise, and I double dog dare you if you haven't signed up yet. Um, finally, please do us all a favor and turn your cell phones to silent. 
I say that, and yet pretty much every night somebody's phone goes off. So <laughs> please, even if you think you have, t double check to make sure that you've turned it to silent. Um, and now, having taken care of all the housekeeping, uh, and you know, you guys don't want to hear from me any, any more than you have to, I'm going to invite faculty member, longtime and beloved faculty member, Eileen Miles to the stage to, in, to introduce Ronaldo Wilson. Eileen. Does that suggest I'm really short? Is that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is this is fun. I'm great. Um, mixed media artist, writer, dancer, and performer Ronaldo Wilson earned his BA from UC Berkeley, his MA at NYU, and his PhD from the City University of New York's Graduate Center. I was hoping we could have dinner after the reading. I wonder if he has plans. Okay. He gave a reading in New York in May that really blew me away. He destabilized writing. The text came in not secondary, but in an associative way with movement and film and visual material on a screen. He even took a print, he's amazing, he even took a print class here last week. How cool is that? He is the co-founder of the performance-based Black Took Collective. Something about him, oh, his books include narrative of the life of the brown boy and the white man, poems of the black object, father traveler, Lucy 72, and silent incantations, learning my mother's language. He's also a very appealing human being. You want to know him. <laughs> Among his various accolades, I figured, you know, you get the bio, I thought I'll just filter in the personal things in with the bio, you know, it's interpolation we call it. Um, among his various accolades, he has been honored with an Asian American Literary Award, a Kaveh Kanem Prize, and a Tom Gunn Award for Gay po Poetry. I would give him a MacArthur. <laughs> yes, because he, he is doing it. Genius has to be in action. As a performer, he has taken the stage of the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, UC Riverside's Arts Block, and Georgetown's Lannan Center, among others. It was at St. Mark's Church where I heard him with Fred Moten, killer event. Claudia Rankin offers this, with audacity and wit, reminiscent of the work of Hilton Isles, Bell Hooks, Franz Fanon, and James Baldwin, Wilson decodes socio-political narratives around race, sexuality, and class. Yes. I've been slowly poring over Virgil Kills, this book of his, um, stories that came out from Nightboat in, in 2022. For me, the writing is dream-based, a great place to start, or a manner in which to hold everything. And this is a quote. He goes, race is not a field. It is, Virgil notes, the work of composition. You know? Or, or this too. This is like, these, this book is like, drawing for Virgil is feeling, and so is writing. Um, Wilson is currently an associate professor of creative writing and literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and splits his time between Santa Cruz and Long Island. I'm glad he's here. I'm grateful we're sharing this week. Ronaldo. Okay.
Jackson's coming in it. And um No, we're doing some silly little thing we want to do. Okay, so tell me when I'm at ten. And then you have to say ten and then So I say it out loud? Yeah, right when you have ten minutes left. Okay. I need someone who I don't know. Oh yeah. Um, but I'm not starting until I'm starting. Like, this doesn't count. Like, it only starts when the clock starts. It doesn't start when the venue needs to breathe. Diversity and inclusion has to do with the human being on CP time, which is not colored people's time, which is clutch and patch time, which is the rule, because I rule. Schoolhouse Rock taught me how to be a boy, and I discovered from Wilkinson that Christy, Kirsty, and Scott Bale taught me how to drive into the impulse of the ego. In class today, we went to the beach we went to go. We followed the gray we goed. We looked for the gray we goed. We took that diversity statement and cathected it into our class. The whole class took an impulse bath. And what we decided at the very moment is you cannot hide yourself from the attack. But what my greatest students, Stephen, among the other great his students taught me was to breathe and let it go and I'm letting it go because it's never forgotten it's in a resin nor is race ever forgotten nor is the top ever forgotten nor is the impasse ever forgotten nor is the trespass ever forgotten nor is the forgotten never molded nor will I ever prepare anything anymore in my life I'm always working not for you but for Eileen Miles who when I was a fellow here in 1999 she looked at me and I don't know if they remember if they remember I was holding chicken and Eileen then she said do you work here I had the audacity to be offended I had the audacity to render it linearly I had the audacity to not understand the caress of class that the institution provides all kinds of barriers so someone like Eileen and someone like me we only meet and someone like Thomas, and someone like Thomas and Ronaldo and Eileen, we meet at the interstice and the junction of the affirmative acts. Did I say shun? If you didn't hear it, you are politely shun. Did I say C? If you're thinking A, you have a class problem and it's not mine. <laughs> oh, I feel so much better now. I had to get it off of my West. Oh, how many? Oh, I, I know, I'll just say I'm waiting for 10, so I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> um, I'm announcing my virginity. <laughs> this is a conversation around the always popping cherry. You weren't warned. I'm just gonna do something for exactly 20 minutes. It's probably like 12, just go, um, we'll go. So um, we don't know what's gonna happen. Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. I can do it, but I don't wanna mess up. Next slide, yeah, I don't wanna control this thing. Next slide, 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 next slide. I mess up, 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 I mess up. Next slide. Fred Liang taught me how to do this. Over Zoom, he dad. Fred taught me how to do this, how to move to a higher scale. What he didn't teach me was feeling or the enactment of my star. I'm not following the North One, just like I told you all. I only, 
Next slide. Continental is the forehand grip he taught us. I miss his voice against a stranger's. Next slide. I knew how to do this after I worked with Prince. I knew how to do this with Karen Dosh. I knew how to sketch the tomato in the valley, in the valley of the low, the low bounding browns and tomatoes of Sacramento. Tonight you'll test that theory. If you're in a restaurant and you look to the kitchen and you see all the blacks and all the whites are serving you, enjoy your dinner. Next slide. Oh, I heard Freeman's is great. <laughs> You know, out of the paper, I'm just playing. <laughs> I hold on to and bring into the drawings what I will print whenever I return. I can see only to the form of swimming in the bay. This one, this one above me, a double rain, yo, so below I go. Next slide, please. Fred picked this for the student show. I was elated, I said, why? Maybe it's got something to do with he recognized like Thomas knew the etchings of the hood. Cholo sketches and Karen Dosh make you feel like you're less pressured. There you go, you brownies, you see. Feeling to ceiling, next slide. Next one, too smart. <laughs> too painterly. Next slide. Uh huh, uh huh, next slide. Uh, 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 uh. I'll hit play on this. Please. Hit it! Can we crank that volume? I need some music in this, in this yacht. I can't hear any music anymore. You did a little bit. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, see? Crank that sheet. See, that's so much better. Next, next slide. Oh, let's see what's popping off here. In the little shadow of a nut. It's a full moon tonight. Everyone's laughing around. It's a full moon tonight. Everyone's dancing Everyone's around. It's a full moon it's tonight. It's a full moon tonight. Everyone's dancing in the quartet. Everyone's laughing around. It's a full moon tonight. It's a full moon And my study tonight. has been hijacked. Everyone's laughing around. It's not like we didn't it's a full know moon from tonight. Barbara Christian. Everyone's laughing It's not like around. we didn't know from June it's Jordan. A full moon tonight. It's not like we don't know Everyone's from Mara. It's not like we don't know from Rashawn. It's not like we don't know from Tim, are they? It's not a lie. You don't know from me. Stop acting like you don't know. Next slide. Uh huh, halfway. Split. Ma, I knew it. 
This is when I knew that I was going to slay. My hand is harder than you thought you knew the poetry was. The theory is crisp, but guess what? I believe in the temple of Shirley, Shirley, Shirley Temple. Shirley, surely, Shirley Temple Black. Surely Temple Black on the good ship. Lollipop on the good ship. I drew that table. I made a connection between my parents, between living and the dead. Next slide. Oh yeah, play that middle video, please. They keep on climbing all over me. Oh yeah, crank that. want me to come in. Kind of a nice farm, huh? Mm-hmm. Johnny started all that. So this there's beddings over there. In the middle of an art show, I realized my mother was all the things that I knew she was. In the middle of an art show, uh, Laura Mullen said, uh, your studio is the garden. In the middle of the studio, I found out that my mother did more damage with a pitchfork and a knife in her backyard to Rototill as a response to her husband's death. Here they come, the family back home to get the squash blossoms. Next slide. Uh, that's a print, my mother, and then some more uh, fine drawings. I did at home before I started studying with anyone. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide, lovebirds. Oh! This is my favorite. It's gonna be a tough one. Oh, how am I in time? Am I the five minute mark? Okay, so we'll play a little of this. This is a tough, and it's not tough. Play please the so lo bottom thing. You'll hear something. We live in Japan for many years. Five years. Five years. And then in Tennessee for many, many years. Guam. Yeah, we live in Guam too. It's a very, very uh, you know, it's not a rich life. But it was a, a, but it was a rich life. Maybe not. It was a. But before it was a rich life. What is it called? It was a, it was a life of richness, right? Like Agana. rich experiences, yeah. you know. Daddy went to school. Oh, the Clayton went to school there, and he get his aviation mechanics. That's how he knows how to pick the And Daddy was was stationed in Hawaii for over two years while I was still in the Philippines. He was trying to get me, but I cannot get out. How come? Because my, my passport and all that, you know, don't be really approved. Oh, it's it's slow. Yeah, hair is good. And then you know he he, he is so nice, and he said. How about here? What well, does it look like? If I marry you, my Oh, it almost looks like my father's dead my hand is moving because the screen makes oh, it look like wow. he's shifting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. said, that was my father's said, last yeah, I'm gonna marry you. hold with so my mother. When he leaves, you oh, know, pause I that. Was pretending that my dad I was Oh, a little forward. Get that watch. Get that. Oh, that's okay. I yeah. don't like him because uh -huh. he's so he's so down to earth. He doesn't brag about anything. Hmm. He said, I'm always working in the ship. How about here? But I, you know, I left my mom and my dad Thanks, at Sarah. home with my brother in the in the air force and my other brother. I don't know. Village. Oh, that's here. That's that's when I was. Oh yeah, this is good. I like that. And then and then we'll close because I, I think I want to. gonna go. You know, this early. I love this song. I'll do it with my. <laughs> 
I really see. thought that he would come back okay. from that. Tell me when it's I, I, like... I kind of feel that he's not. Three minutes. No, no. Tell you. me when yeah, I have I mean, three I, minutes I, and then I'll freestyle for three minutes. You can feel and because when the doctors me. were saying, oh, we can't do much of anything. I concentrate on my dancing. Don't bother me. Guys, you be together and all that. I see. Mm, you think that he is not, he is not go, going to last till the following day. In, in the morning that I came, this when is you for called, my benefit. It came out that he is still alive. Like, seriously. Yeah, it's not for your cold, entertainment. She said that she I have to figure out how to rebalance my walk after disruptions. She said, this guy I get paid way too much. And by the way, I mean, I know it's not your fault, but I'm a full professor. <laughs> Step three. And I'm about Why to bust through step six, and I should have been, as many well, of the she, writers she said, the <laughs> what is it the called? called it. Oh. Nah. And you yeah, know, there's the, another the, term. The, the I don't know it yet, but we'll know it. Uh -huh. called her and left Distinguish. Message. Right when I went for tenure, they said Ronaldo should have been distinguished five years ago. Why are you bothering me with this letter? But. Said, As my mother says, she didn't it. give up her dignity, nor did I. And I decided we're going to pull it out, and we think we can treat him, and we think he's going to be naked. Okay. That was as my father was dying, I was making these videos. But we think that we can treat it. Okay, next slide. They didn't lie, right? We live in Japan. We could do a risky thing. Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. Like, just go crazy, just go nuts. Just be like, boom, boom. So you see all the paintings and the... Next slide. We're done. Oh, this is a good one. I don't want to juvenilize myself. Next slide. Okay. That's good, because I was looking fit, good. Yeah, so I'm talking about. Go back, oh, that's, these are my emoji things. Go back to the body so people remember the color of my skin, actually, in the summer when it's banging. I'm all dark. Oh, I'm gonna put on black. Uh, no, it's good. And if I go over three, oh, can I have a, see a timer? Like just a watch with a timer. Oh, just if you put it on that thing, then I can see the three minutes going down, then I know how to execute what I need to say because I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my feelings right now. I'm not playing, I'm actu it's actually true. Thank you, my dear. Can we risk shutting off that video? What would happen? Will there be an image that shows up? There's a little baby image there. But you can't see it. Yeah, again, you've been treated to enough images. I'm just going to sit behind an image that I know is unedited behind me out of visuality. Is that boring? Is it compositionally okay? Yeah. Okay, I have, I'm gonna do something. And then, Sarah, we're gonna play a game. Just turn it back on and see what happens at the end. And it'll be the end of the performance. Ready? It's a duet now. The reason why I should have been a long, long time ago a professor of distinction because I, a long, long time ago, studied only with professors of distinction. This means several things. The majority of them were black and brown, and they were not on this coast. They were on another coast, but guess what? They hugged and hold, hold, held me until I could get on a plane to the East Coast with a woman who was leaving for the rest of her life into another life under the osp under the nod and permanence that I would meet another group of black and brown and white queer poetics officials of the term. Graduate school was easy. The MFA was easy. Painting is easy. Being me is easy. What is not easy is the assault. 
What is not easy is always remembering the reminder. What is not easy is always the bump. What is not easy is always the threatening mark. What is not easy is always the black that cuts into the soil and the sand and below that into what's under that, maybe more sand and more sand and more sand and guess what, water, I have no idea where magma goes but it's not easy when you have to go magma and your heart has to hold your body in a precise line. This is distinction. This is being distinguished. This is what was once called the talented 10th, which should have been the talented eyelash wing, or gull, or breath, or sound wave, or sound barrier, or beam, or fin cutting. That's it, that's all I got. Thank you. I'm gonna move all this stuff. This I'm gonna move up so Eileen can have. I need to give. Um, we need to give Ronaldo Wilson some more applause. That's what we need. To do. You're not gonna see that every day. That's for sure. Um, now I'd like to invite one of Eileen Miles' students to the stage to introduce Eileen. Kennedy Coyne, please come on up. Hello. Hi. Is okay. I am so delighted to introduce the icon that is Eileen Miles. Um, they probably don't remember this, but the first time I met Eileen was in 2017 at the Poetry Project's New Year's Day reading at St. Mark's Church, where I waited eight hours <laughs> until I finally built up the courage to run up to them and say, you're my favorite writer, and scurry off. Um, <laughs> and it was the first time I saw Eileen read live and occupy a space in which Eileen, occupying a space in which Eileen Miles gets to read is incomparable. Um, I'd been following them for a few years before that as an 18 year old who was coming into and discovering her queerness and figuring out what it meant to be a writer. And my entry into Eileen's work was actually through a crush I had on Cherry Jones. Um, <laughs> whose character uh, in Transparent was inspired by Eileen Miles, who is even cooler and more crushable. Um, and so I needed to know who Eileen Miles was. And I ordered the sac sacred text that is Chelsea Girls, the 2015 edition with a maple shot, Maplethorpe shot of a doe-eyed young Eileen. Um, and like many people who first encounter Eileen's work, I didn't know what to expect when I started reading it, but my world exploded. It opened up um, as a queer person, as a writer, as a queer writer, and there is no text like it. And I distinctly remember thinking, I never read anything like this, and I've never read anything like it since. Um, it pushed against everything I'd been taught. Their prose is the kind of prose that is poetry and is musical and is oddly conversational while also very interior, natural and unfiltered and provocative and transparent and queer, and that's all of their work. Like a painting or a photograph, you can look at a piece of Eileen Miles writing and know it is an Eileen Miles work. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, their prose resists traditional narrative form, disrupts grammar and mechanics, omits commas, plays with sentences, sometimes ones that last pages long. Their poems have these signature short lines stripping down the left side of a page, 
just hanging down, and gosh, their writing, it just, it moves, it runs. And as readers were simultaneously inside their head and also having a conversation with them, there's movement and body in their work. Even their handwriting is art. It takes up space on these yellow legal pads with thick pilot ink. It could be framed on a wall. It probably already is somewhere. In Sex and the Sacred Text, Michelle T. writes, I wonder what my life would look like if I hadn't read Eileen Miles. I can't imagine who I would be or what exactly I would be doing. For years, I thought of Eileen Miles as my own, my, my own secret special writer. Likewise, something in me changed after reading Miles. Their lines live in my body. Lately, I fall back on, you can't force a story that doesn't want to be to told, and I'll be a poet. What could be more foolish and obscure? And I am always hungry and wanting to have sex. <laughs> Eileen Miles is a poet in every sense of the word, ethereal, discerning, genuine, their voice, their influence, their cadence, the way their words, their performance, it's compelling and intimate. They are such an important voice of a whole queer generation. And here's their more formal bio. Poet and multi-genre writer Eileen Miles earned their BA from the University of Massachusetts. They moved to New York City in 1974 to become a poet and later served as artistic director of St. Mark's Poetry Project. They've written more than 20 books in many genres, including poetry, fiction, nonfiction, libretti, plays, and performance pieces. Their publications include A Working Life, Pathetic Literature, For Now, and Evolution. They've been honored with four Lambda Literary Literary Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Shelley Prize, and a Poetry Award from the Foundation for Contemporary Arts. Their work has been praised as full of both, quote, contradictions and coincidences, joy and despair, the in intricacies of life and death, all captured in brief, fleeting poetry told in tight verse. A lover of dogs and bikes and bold pens and trees and green tea, but only the really, really strong kind, I am honored to welcome Eileen Miles. Thanks, Kennedy. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I was thinking, this is Ronaldo's. I don't think I'll read your work tonight, Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought um, I would read, I'm gonna read a, um, an essay that I just wrote and a couple of new poems, and then I'll read some poems from here. Um, this is called Perverse Reading. The thing I will say about being young is that I hated it. I wasn't anybody. I was broke. My apartment was a mess. I shouldn't drink so much. I only stopped criticizing my body when I was doing drugs. And the thing I liked about the act of reading is that my body would get lost and I would go someplace else. The thing I didn't think so much about was the pages, so many of them and turning, turning all the time as the moments passed and I was free. If I liked a song, I would play it again and again. It didn't strike me as peculiar. I remember one song that made me feel so elevated when I listened to it that I became this other person I called a Rococo Wanderer. And she just wandered around in an, a bodiless way on the face of the earth and saw things. The turning of the record created that. The black disc turning, making time in mind. I was dreaming. And the record was a chant, though a petrochemical, electrical one. It required I pay my bill, which I mostly did. But I hated paying my bills, and I hated doing dishes. I hated cleaning the cat litter again and again. I hated going down the stairs of my building, and I hated going up. 
I hated the subway. I hated doing my laundry. Though I liked watching it go round and round once it was in and I could sit in the wooden bench dreaming. I hated holidays. I hated them coming again, thinking of last year, my family wanting me back, and the compulsiveness with which I went to them. I had liked going to confession when I was a practicing Catholic. I liked the relief. Though I confessed the same poems, sins, again and again and again, and when I said something different, it got weird. Suddenly it was about him, the priest, rather than the previous no one, by doing nothing, getting wiped clean. I stopped going. I started going to therapy about five years ago. I meant to go slightly before, but instead I got in a relationship. <laughs> and mostly in therapy, we talked about her, but my therapist pronounced her name funny, kind of misgendering her. And I liked that, but he always forgot to use my correct pronoun, which I didn't like. When she was gone, we talked about me, and we arrived on the great topic, which is the return. I've concluded that the reason rock stars die young is they didn't want to do it. I did. I came in saying the reason I had come was this feeling I had that I was turning a corner and I wanted help with that. My therapist would remind me that turning a corner was my request when I came to him, and instead we spent three or four years talking about her. It made me dislike her, though I certainly thought that was my definition of a relationship, being obsessed, and if I were a whiteboard, it would be about wiping me out daily, daily and writing in her. We got to it in the aftermath of her, and it's this. He said, the, this point in my life, and he meant late. I'm fairly late in the day. I think I'm like a rambunctious evening. <laughs> in which you may or may not go out. But you've done everything before. Some things a lot, and other things not enough. And he was like, what is it that you haven't done enough of? And that's a big open spot. And though I like to confess all, I want to say, I want to say, all I want to say is that that spot is, and I can fill it, and that's what I'm doing right now. I remember watching Julian Beck cut vegetables in the kitchen with a good knife on a cutting board. That was a film, and he was very important to the person who gave me the film, and not so much to me, but that scene has stayed with me all my life. I dream that someone has a camera and follows me in the morning. It's like the Walter Mosley book I found on the sidewalk one night on the corner. It was bent, having just fallen out of somebody's back pocket. I read it, feeling in love with the randomness of the gift. I hope the camera never comes, but I like the sensation of being alone with the thought. It's how I have a soul. And my dog has a soul, too. Her soul wants to take the same walk again and again. <laughs> we are lying in bed, and the thing that makes the day start happens. I'm mostly happy if I fell asleep reading, or that, or that was the last thing I did, turning pages rather than foisting all that electronic light into my brain. I fell asleep dull and in the private world of my book. Okay, I might as well get up, and it could be six, but it's most likely eight. I stick my glasses on and my phone into the pockets of my pajamas. I go into the kitchen, I look out the window, and I see the light, and then I put the water on. There might be dishes in the sink. My ex used to be passionate about cleaning the kitchen at night, and I brought that regime into my life for a while, and indeed the emptiness of the clean kitchen felt great, but I don't have to do that and I'll wipe a knife or a spoon while the water's boiling. About two years ago, I stopped drinking coffee and moved to green tea. It's a softer high and better for ritual. It's full of ritual like a cigarette. The water boils, and I cool it for two minutes, and then I pour it into the kusu. I wait two and a half minutes, and I drink that tea, and then I do it again. The second time, it seeps for three minutes. There's a third infusion, but I generally wait and drink that later in the day. I'm doing that right now. I just want to say, as I watch my numbers shrinking, this piece is only so long, and that all the things that destroyed me in life, the horror of dailiness, I now experience with this neglectful respect. <laughs> Perverse reading, again and again, what I find. I think of the hot day in summer, many years ago in New York. I was living upstate, so I was in Manhattan in hot fucking August, doing errands, and it was hell. I'm walking down St. Mark's Place in a pile of anxious dread, and I had the thought, it will always be like this. <laughs> and I thought it again, it will always be like this. And it was cool. It was like air conditioning. <laughs> everything, everything was cooling. And with notable exception, like I do fall into a pit, but this is pretty much my life. 
This condemned dailiness, cutting, cleaning, jumping on the subway, going around and around, being watched, and there's no one there at all. And the dog nods because she wants her walk, that walk, and we do it every day. And every day is exactly the same but different. I'm on a plane, and I've done this before. Listen, feel the lift. <laughs> um, here. And, and this is kind of a new poem, and it's about an obsession of mine. Well, I'm perched over Paris, I want to say hello. The camera on the plane pulls back, and now it's looking on the ocean, and then a, a list of names. The Pyrenees are dangling down there. Only on a map are mountains flat. I like mountains because they remind me of the history of the world getting poured. A mountain is a kind of splash, ocean's residue, and I can rise to the plight of fish. More are killed than anything. I don't know what to do with the endlessness of my feelings. I'm the last one on earth thinking about orchard a cruel name for a small dog found in the streets of an unkind city, a dog of no gender, blue-gray, slightly red, and when he was captured by the city for no purpose except this small dog should go there, he was so appalled and confused by this hard cell he found himself in, he peed and pooped on the floor. He's scared, I cried, thinking that would bring some love. He needed someone to fill out forms and to walk in the door and bring Little Orchard home, but he's dead. In a city, a small dog that no one wants gets a needle in his heart. It stops, maybe, not right away, but he's tossed in a bag, brought to a cremation on, on a crematory, crematorium on Long Island that has a blazing fire full of cats and dogs. The city pays them so much to do this terrible burning that some dogs, like Orchard, are covering a debt. Orchard was just weight, like the slight addition of his death helped somebody out in keeping the figures in line. The payment must have a purpose. The further from the dogs, the emptier the line is, all being kept on a computer some way that gets erased from time to time because the cheapness of this story, a dog got a pretty name, but no hands come for his warm, pretty shoulder. I've made him a boy with colors in his fur and light in his eyes, and he would run. I was like... I keep trying to save dogs, and it just sometimes I just get so I, I just don't know what to do. So I just thought, go for it. Just, and this is this is called this is a similar note. <laughs> like somebody was apologizing for the sadness in their reading the other night, and I was like, you don't know. <laughs> Here it comes. This is called ginger ale. You don't want to think about chickens going over London. Millions of chickens opening their eyes. The person in the front row was like, oh. <laughs> Millions of chickens opening their eyes for one second, waking up in a cage, no, in a wide field of tiny chickens, like a mile-wide tray. And they get these chemicals on their feet. That's the only way I can imagine it, filled with sex, a sex drug that makes them wild, distorted, crippled. And how did they kill the chickens all at once? Where did chickens come from, anyway? Some chickens wake up in a nice place and wind up at Leslie's, where they live for a while, having friends living in her yard with their different personalities, but the millions and trillions of the other kind, one flash of light, then they're eaten on a plane. We're flying and we're eating them. And aren't they birds? And the plane is going over water now, a plane full of killers, <laughs> desperately looking for something good with their fingers. But there's nothing good. How could there be? The chicken's death is not in our hands. Something else is. And we're, I keep, um, I'm obsessed with rhymes a bit in my workshop this week, so this is just a, this is called rhyme. The first part of this recovery from all things, these greener pastures so empty, I smelt the burn of the pan that hadn't been lit, I have to stop paying for OK Cupid. <laughs> That's a really bad rhyme. <laughs> it was just, OK Cupid? It was just like, OK, I'm going to read from this book now, a couple of these poems. I was, um, this is, I have the list. Okay, let me do that. This is March 3rd. I'm just going to, I've read a lot from this book, but I'm, d I'm reading the ones that I still love a lot. 
The quick exchange of emails between the former lovers creates a soft hole in the day and the night before. It snowed, but it was supposed to be larger and everything's closed. The streets are wet, I hear, and I won't step into them. One poem for today, but no, many little ones. The coffee slightly altered is good. My bare feet in bed ready to work. I work in the field of dreams where I've met you many times. I felt closer to you this morning and probably last night when the, sto the doorway slightly opened because of our notes was flooded with ghosts. When I was young, I liked the emptiness of my home, and now, like it or not, there is this sweet accumulation. The cameras, all that, everything I do can't touch the single statement of breeze and loss and quaint beauty, things I've had since I was a kid, the secrets of my home. I feel condemned by this chaotic museum of stuff, and yes, I desire to photograph it, the bowls you liked, the cup you touched, and me in a t-shirt that used to be special, and now I carouse in bed with myself in it. I don't know if this will ever be different, and that is the feeling of this. I feel like a tree, the invisible part of friendship and drinking together and warning. One empty wall is the least I can do for myself. Late at night, I enjoy the brown pages of a cowboy show. TV on my lap till practically dawn. Interesting, written by a gambler. Oh, I have so many shows. When in Florence one day you were taking a shower, I think I thought I love this television. Because it's become the way to love, the road of becoming is a screen belonging on it in my dream. The excellent moments the man bodges in and says, do you ever think about film? The poetry of accident haunts like a circus tent over my days, and that fades in a new one. I begin to write about dying. This story ends. It begins to be part of the plot, and do, you love, do I love you for your distance from it, or could I love you because you are close or your exciting difference, so smart? I love myself. The squeaky little voice that says, in here, owning the void and grooving on it, voice over, you're not so bad, and then I begin to work. My dead mother is around, my lover not far, keeping you here, not calling anyone. Is that the tub in which I die? Where do, woo, woo, woo. What's that bird? Because I don't have kids, and this is such a blessing. <laughs> this is, uh, this is and this one's called Put My House. This is like a, a COVID love poem, because they were there and I was here. And I thought, the poem will do the trick. Kind of. Yeah. Put my house inside the boat. Can we do that? Put my dog inside of your dog. Put these birds inside of yours. Put my ocean. Put your ocean all over my mountains. Put my mountains in there. Put my dog in yours. My dog walk is safe inside your dog walk. Let me eat inside you. Let me eat your food. Let me eat your house. Put your house inside my dog. Put your dog on my boat. Naturalize. Put my heart in yours. Put my mouth on your mouth. Put my hair in yours. Let me breathe inside you. Let me smell your guts. Put your boat in my eye. Let me eat your friends. Put these hours inside your hours. Eat this bird, cheap. Eat my dog's foot. Eat that ocean. Run to him or the o ocean. Run to them, hear these birds cheep. Fly to me, eat my foot. Put my house inside yours, in your mind, think me fly. This fly me home, love me now, forget your phone, eat my heart, run to him or the o ocean. Tweet, 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 dog growl, cluck, click. Put my house right in there. Yeah, that's me looking out the window. Look at me, bark, bark, bark. Put your heart inside that bark. This is sort of a family poem. Did your family say, um, look what the cat dragged in? Yeah. I think, um, no, it's not what it's supposed to be. Cat. Oh. Sometimes I feel like I'm in, that's, a, that's the title of a poem. Sometimes I feel like I'm, some, I'm in some movie about death. This rainy night, pull your hood off and get inside. The eerie splashing silence of it, each eerie step. No, I do not want to get on your bus unlocking my bike. I thought about them tonight. I could try, go on a journey, see everyone. No one does that anymore. And then we were all in the room, Zoom room. And that's why I was thinking of them, because they were there. I don't know them at all. I could make the effort. I'd be known as them that came that one time. 
the whole city gleaming in my head, wet and black. I'm out in it with my groceries. I don't even want you now, I've got to say this. She showed up late, and I thought, look what the cat dragged in. It meant we were close. And there they were in my head. That's where they lived, feeding me things. Look what the cat dragged in. Would she know it was love? Would anyone? I'm just going to read worse and worse poems and see if you keep clapping. <laughs> There's just two more. Could go to shit right away. Oh, actually, this is called Monday Shit. I was, I was not being clever. But and this is, this is um, I have had scorn for dreams in the past, but I started to write poems right out of dreams, and this is one of those. Like you just wake up and start writing in your notebook instantly. Um, I don't know if I'm knowing something or falling apart. I put my f two feet together. It's Monday. I put the water on. I was dropping a man off a dark-haired friend. I was parked in the middle of the plaza. I can't stay here. I went inside a little. I got to go. And I went up there over the lumpy hills. The store where the women work, my friends, the old guitar store, everything's different now because of the pandemic. I want to go to that, I think. Can I put my bike behind the counter or up there? No, because we're moving. I see plenty of room. Next time I'm all involved with them, the kids, and they're playing outside. I'm in the apartment somehow, and everyone's gone. Like I woke. I could have put my bicycle anywhere. It's morning. I call the children like it's morning. Where did this shit come from? And I found the morning coffee, and this is a miracle. I just called them, and they came in like dogs. I dreamed this world. That's it. Does it work this way? Working, dreaming, having a life, making, and dying. Why did I die to dream this? And everyone that knows me or something somewhere or some while, I know you once in a while. I truly forgot about him. I didn't know he was going to do that. Everybody's not in a dream but me or we find each other here. I didn't know their fucking names, but I found their children. I was first. I'm waking here. It's perfect, everything, because coffee's like music. I thought about quitting in the future for the better. Orgasm, I read that. Did it once in the 80s. We were camping and shit. Whoa. Waking up from that dream into this, but my cave, my hovel, afraid to put it in a suitcase will my dreaming come. The feeling of flowing with you, but you have seven stories, and I have three, possibly three, one flooded with a baby. Do I know? All I know is this kid. I'm just thinking about what you've, you're getting into as I'm making my day. How did it end this time? Feeding the yellow dog. I was looking for a parking place, and it was my dyke, my children, and I didn't know anyone's names. Is this the story that holds the future, or is this the day so marvelous? Pouring some of it over and over there. I think it's perfect in me, this prophecy right here. Now it holds. Um, I'm going to just read one more. Um, this is called Lucky Kittens. And my mother, my mother's, you know, my mother died, and she's all over this book. Um. I met someone, co something cool, and I can't shake it. I want to write a poem to the new thing. Nothing more trans than taking a shit in the men's room in a hotel. <laughs> also, I had a perfect breakfast, and I'm well. I exercise, all good things, and once again, I'm flying. A world without mother is a world without me. I'm not crying, I'm flying. Honestly, I took my mother's tear from the corner of her eye. It happened when she died. I took it on my finger and I wiped it on my jeans. The rattling of paper is an exquisite disconnect. Old fashioned, all breaks, making space, always ready for a fight. My heat is instantly shadowy, like a moving hand or sound, like no jazz at all. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Some more applause for Eileen Miles, please. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite another one of our esteemed and beloved faculty, Sarah Schulman, to the stage to introduce Thomas Vu. Sarah. Thank you. 
So the great American painter Rochelle Feinstein said about Tom, Tomas Wu, he's a good person and a good artist. And how many people can you say that about? <laughs> Tomas is the uh, Leroy Neiman Professor of Visual Arts at Columbia University, where he's been since 1996. He's also the Artistic Director of the Leroy Neiman Center for Print Studies. I think we can say Tom Tomas Wu and Leroy Neiman like that. Uh, Tomas uh, has many honors, including a Guggenheim, and um, he was recognized by the Joan Mitchell Foundation. His work is in collections all over the United States, in China, in Japan, all over Europe. He studied at undergraduate at the University of Texas, and his MFA is from Yale. And he was born in Saigon, where he learned about surfing. He's currently making, I believe it's 287 surfboards, one for each song written by the Beatles. Please welcome Tomas Vu. Okay, hi. Well, huge mistake following these two. <laughs> huge mistake. <laughs> Why didn't I say, I'll go first? <laughs> but, um, and so I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to follow this shit? I'm fucked. And I'm, at this point, my head is just spinning. I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, I mean just listening to you. I mean, yeah, the stuff that grows out of there. I, I, I'm sitting there going, I'm going to sound like a freaking idiot <laughs> following this. So I'm hoping that some of the images will trigger me to some of this narrative that uh, I can do, because right now I'm, a lot of, I'm blanking on things. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I have this first image up here that's really uh, it's just um, a signifier for the two projects I'm going to talk about. Um, you can, as you can see in the back, in the murky back, it's it's a portrait of, of uh, Theodore Kaczynski, who's also AK, uh, also known as uh, the Unabomber. And so the whole structure of, I mean, for the past ten years or so, I've been working on this body of work, and it's obviously starting out with the the, the manifesto. And um, so that's sort of like is the trigger for all of the about to come. Do I have, am I in control? Okay. So I'll talk about the Unabomber along the way. But um, the two projects I've been, uh, that I've been working on, um, it all started in 1969. Oh, no, that's a long time ago. I remember... What I remember about 1969 is I was, I was living in Saigon, and I was running through the street of Saigon with my older, two older brothers. And we were just running, and he was in such a hurry. He was yanking me along. He said, just hurry it up. We're going to miss this. We're going to miss this. So we would run from bars to bars. The first one we would go to, I remember three bars, but he said, no, there, there was a lot more that we went to. My older brother said this, this to me. And... Um, and we would just go in there. We would ask if there was a t television, and there was not. So we would run to the next one, to the next one. And finally, we ran into one where it was a bar where mostly American GIs hung out. And there was a, sure enough, there was a television there. And what was on television, I couldn't really see it. I mean, I, I don't remember much about it. It's just a dark black and white image. Um, and it was of the moon landing. And I, what I, I, you know, I keep on. I, I at a later date, I asked my brother, "What was it that we, s that I was looking at?" You know, because I, you know, you see this l guy bounce off something. <laughs> yeah. So what? But what was important there was not what was I was looking at, but what was happening around it. There were a lot of people. There were people crying actually. The Americans and the Vietnamese all in the same place just staring at this thing, crying, very emotional. I just remember the stillness and the quietness of, of the place, you know, and that's what I remember of 1969. And so this is the, this is the beginning of this, 
the idea of this project. And so, um, and I was hugely influenced by David Bowie growing up. And so to start off this project, I, this project is called Space Oddity. Um, it's about the, that very narrative. In, in the, what was important about 19, 1969 for me was it's about the promise of the future, right? This technology that's taken us to this point. And so when I had an opportunity to do this project in Berlin, I literally, I, my studio was right down the street from where Bowie was when he, he did his trilogy, the, the, the three albums there. And so that was, that was the trigger for, the, for, for this series of work. Okay. This is one of the, f so there were three rooms. Um, I painted the floor, I mean basically turning everything upside down in that way. And there are three astronauts in there. And this is two, they're kind of um, sort of starting with that, the, the moon landing I narrative. And this is the second room where, oh, it's just a second room. <laughs> Paintings, blah, blah, blah. Not very important after all. After all. In very influenced by, in obviously, in the architecture and the kind of mapping of ideas. Actually, the interesting thing about this is the blue walls are, are made out of cyanotype. What I did there is I painted the whole room in cyanotype, masked it off, hoping that the sunlight would come in and expose that over the course of the, 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 the time of the installation. But the sun didn't get far enough, so I had to fake it and use real UV bulb to flush it out. And then this is the third room where I built a skateboard ramp and turned it Sideway as a curve, and then uh, using these um, these drawings, everything was done at the installation. So I made these. Uh, well, I, the idea here, um, actually, the um, the drawings come from the this book by Ray Kurzweil called uh, Singularity is Near, and that's about, you know talking about the future of 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 and his. His whole thing is, the, oh, well, by the time 2045 comes around, the new master race will be the machine, right? And all of that kind of thing. It, that's the sort of the things I'm interested in. And so each one of these drawings, what I did is I ordered the, um, that book in German, and I mounted on each. Each drawing has a page. So m the task at hand was I was going to make 200, I mean 400 and something drawings. I only got to 211. It was too, it was too much. Um, and these are just made out of sonotype and collage of drawings and stuff like that. Anyway, um, I'll speed through it. Oh, so here are some of the drawings, that, I mean, the details of some of the drawings. Oh, we got more. <laughs> oh, there you are. And these three large paintings are in, was in the first room. Um, They're just dudes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the sec this is the second project. Um, and it's also, it's, it's still in line with the kind of Bowie kind of narrative. Uh, Bowie made a movie in 1976 called The Man Who Fell to Earth. Um, and so th um, this installation is in uh, Brooklyn at the Boiler Room. God, it's really weirdly distorted. It's much bigger space than this. Well, the dome is actually uh, 25 feet in diameter by 16 feet. You can't see it here. It doesn't look much like much. But um, 
So uh, let me see. Maybe there's. And inside the dome, um, it, it was up for a month. And uh, what I did is I invited the local bands or anyone who's interested in readings or poets. And they would come and perform um, each night. So it was open. It was an, like an open mic. And anyone can go in there. So there were a lot of bands who came through and uh, lots of readings. And let me see. All right. Yeah. Whatever, it's out there somewhere. <laughs> okay, still in, the, in, in terms of, you know, the images that, that, that are formed. I mean, obviously, you know, with that, that Bowie narrative, it was, it was about this alien who came to Earth because his planet was, it was, it was, um, it was in a crisis. You know, there was a huge drought, and he came to Earth hoping that he can get water and bring it back to his planet. But along the way, you know, he was corrupted by, um, he said he became addicted to, to alcohol and all that stuff. And so, he, you know, what, what it talks about is the, fall, the, the failure, and you know, he became almost too human. There was failure in that. But he, in, uh, what he did was he, he uses his alien technology to really create this empire, to hoping to build a ship to bring back water to his planet. But a long way, he didn't make it. Uh, what, uh, why, why do I tell you that story? I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember anything, really. Oh, there he is. <laughs> and yes, I do make surfboards. Uh, uh, and it's, it's 210. It's the complete Beatles anthology. I mean, I can talk about that a little bit since the, the surfboard is there. That's, that's the one that's made in lead. So it will sink like a rock if we try to surf with that <laughs> thing. But there is this. Uh, I grew up in, like I said, in, in Saigon. But uh, part of my life, I, it was in um, Da Nang. It's right on South China Beach where there's um, a huge military base there. It's one of the biggest military base. And I met this young American GI, and he introduced me to the s surfing. Well, I took care of his surfboards. <laughs> and then so along the way, he just, I mean, he's just, just a really young American boy. Couldn't be more than 18 or 19 years old, you know. Good-looking, all-American, Californian. <laughs> and uh, so he... He had this dog, and he had the surfboards. And I would, what I did is, what we did is, we used to take care of his surfboard. We carry his surfboard to the beach, wax it, and then he would sit there, stare at the ocean, the waves, all day. And then finally, he'll get out there, and he'll bring. A, he would bring us along, and there's three of us. So we would stand on his board while he's, he he rides us in. You know, not much, but it was something for a, for a young boy to be introduced to to, to a surf culture. But the, other, the important thing was he introduced me to the Beatles. He would only listen to the Beatles. He would we'd bang it, bring us back to his bread, and we would listen to the Beatles. And so that's why I made, that's why the 210. And um, I'm at, I'm a few albums away. <laughs> Takes forever to make, to do an album here and there. Um, and so these paintings, the same thing, you know, it's, uh, on, on mylar, six feet, I mean, nine feet by five feet, no, four and a half. I think that's it. <laughs> Not much to say. I'd, I'd rather. <laughs> uh. Okay. I think I'm done. Three faculty member back on stage. We're going to do a little Q and A.
La 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 la. La la la. <laughs> Mr. Vu, why did you have the, your Clark pictures at such a low level in that one shot? I'm sorry. I why did you have your pictures at such a low level in one of those galleries? It Take looked like they were very low. Wings and learn oh, to yeah, fly. The, uh, on the second show, <laughs> the, the line. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was, I had two different, I mean, the, the scenarios, the installation, I wanted the astronaut to be above, so when you walk in, it technically it was supposed to hang in a tilt and upside down, so it sort of, ideally, it sort of turned you around a little bit. Just, you know, it's about, um, uh, the orientation of things. I want you to feel like you've been just upside down one way or another. Either you feel that or, but so there's that, and then there's the line. It's it's a timeline, and it, and it it's structural with 1969, and it each image it moves into this thing to the end, to 1976. And that's the thing. You, I didn't show it in that sequence. Yeah. So that's why that. And so it's above and below, the idea of above and below. So thank you all very much. Um, so for Eileen, how do you revise? <laughs> that's it, that's the question, because that's huh. amazing. I mean, I, t I tend not to, I tend to write a lot, and I more like select the good ones out of the lot you know what I mean? Like I write, I write. The 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 biggest revision is the fact that I just it, it abandon most of the poems I write and and pull out the ones that I think are good. You know, so that's because I I like I revise pretty lightly. It's very rare that I really like get in there and fix a poem. They're usually pretty close to what I had in mind when I when I wrote them. You know, they'll be like you know articles and too many words here and there. Sometimes extra stanzas. You know, I feel like if, if, if it feels like blah, 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 I cut it away. I like to leap and almost make have it not make sense, but that it does have to make sense, you know. Hi. Thank you. Is it? Okay. Thank you all very much. This is a question for everyone, and it's kind of related to the previous question. I'm wondering if you have made work early on that you disavowed or hated, and what is your process of dealing with that? <laughs> disavowal? Have we, do you really mean that? I mean, I think you really do mean disavowed the work. Yeah, for sure, but it's not work that I feel I made. I feel it was made in collaboration in an experience outside of my control. That work that's made around the work. You know, the great poet Myung Mi Kim, as we were explaining my lovely class, the way that Myung, I learned this at the, when I was a fellow at Kundiman, as she asks who you are and she says, let's, we could do this again and again and again. And in fact, the revealing of ourselves in that telling, that's really the workshop. And in some ways, perhaps, that's also the disavowed work. The commitments to making work at some point, it's a decision to say, I love this idea of like, you know, it's in revision something happens and then one selects in the same ways that I think, you know, I almost feel like I'm just honored. I just feel like moderating because I, what can I say, right? I mean, I'm lucky to be at the edges of a kind of relationship to whom that question is actually addressed, which is the consolative formation of the universe, the decision of, you know, many lines, the crying and flying. Is that a disavow? Like, how can you throw that away? Or in the inversion of any body, you know, it's meant to kill when you're turned upside down in some forms of alert torture. So how does one select when the mark is made or the poem is made and what are the decisions before the, the art begins? So yes, I think that disavowal is in, for me, in collaboration with my, I mean, really, I, I, I'm a sort of just honored to be in, in the kind of, mm, 
the sort of resin that maybe decides how to really hold the question's heart, which is disavowal as, as a real, you know, thank you for that question, because this is real. I mean, I've, I've just written some bad stuff that I just, I mean, that I, I, you know, I think it's weird with, with archives because it's like, I don't, I don't destroy things. I sort of feel like it's part of my history, but it's not part of his, my history I'm proud of. Like, I wrote a story recently about the first kind of, quote, novel that I ever wrote, and it was really bad. I mean, it was like, I remember how much fun it was to write it, though. It was very exciting because I really wanted to write prose, but I was a poet. And then I showed it to like maybe one person, and they were like, "Oh, you know," and um, and and so it became the subject of other writing to talk about being that that younger person who did that. Mm -hmm. But um, so I guess I would say I disavow that. Or when you have a selected, you wind up looking at all your books and you pick things that should go forward. And there are things that I feel like mm, yeah, I feel a little squirmy about that, you know. But but uh, disavowal seems more harsh, like yeah. annihilating or destroying. And yeah. I think nothing, I feel like I don't really destroy. Once in a while, I just think I don't want anybody ever. Because it's kind of creepy when you hear about writers who are dead and then they go and publish something that they said never oh, published yeah. this. And then they do. You know, so they will do that to me too. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I think if I know that I can't ever bear the thought of this being read, I okay. have to destroy it. But it doesn't happen much. Yeah. I, I've had some experience where um, I made a body of work and then I invited an, an artist in who I re respected tremendously and came in and he sort of shit on it. And then when he left, I painted the whole series black. And that pissed, I mean, I did it. I was like, I'll get you, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. So I did I destroy, so I destroyed months of work mm -hmm. and then in hindsight, you know, I, I might end up throwing those things away because I bury the whole damn thing. And so, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we make things and do things v I impulsively in that way, right? And then also when somebody says something that you respect and you're, also, you're like, and I think at that point I was too young and too weak to really st stand up to that pressure, you know. But was yeah. that at Yale? <laughs> <laughs> no, Yale sucks anyway. <laughs> But actually, um, yeah, it was Mel Bachner. <laughs> Mel. Uh, um, he came in and he said, this shit makes me itch. And then I... Itch? Yeah. Like the, the itch? My mark making was very... It made him so itch? He started scratching himself. Ooh. Oh. This is recorded, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Live streamed, I think. <laughs> I love this. And then oh. so I, I did what I did I, I, because I wanted to... I thought I was getting back at him, you know. It's one of those things you react. It's like, I'll show you, mm -hmm. you know, and then, because he, well, Mel wore black turtleneck, and that, for two years that I was there, he, that's what, black jeans and black turtleneck. So I was like, here, I'll paint the whole damn yeah, thing black for you. Yeah, it's kind of, um, so. so I think that this is really, I mean, I'm going to just say it, right? I mean, you know, disavowals relationship to the tentacular performances of affirmative action. I'm simply in a position of only probably 10 years or so, because I met Eileen when I was 29. And I really do mean, I was like, what do you mean I work here? I, was fe I felt some kind of way. I know, I get it, but I'm smart. You know, I knew that there were like questions of labor, differences, but it's, I, I knew that, you know, Eileen is not gonna waste language and I knew that this wasn't a person, I knew that, you know, all of the conditions that allowed me to be in that room, right? The lineages of, of all the people who, you know, encouraged me, Yusuf Komunyaka for one, who said, I, you were talking to my students who said, you know, I was a fellow here in 1999, and, you know, I read, I was writing a critical edition of Yusuf Komunyaka, Komunyaka's work at, um, in during my, you know, PhD program in English. I have three degrees, they're all in English. I'm not trained in any form of art you know, a BA, a MA, and a PhD in English. So that's kind of like a black painting within itself. What's wrong with me? Of course, I'm an expert <laughs> in the English language. I'm the authority here, uh -huh. How many of you have that triumvirate? I, mm -hmm. But it wasn't as if I didn't hear what Eileen said. I could put it in that context, and I had enough confidence to recognize when, when I needed a lot of growing up to do, 
and not to take something personally. But the 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 the, the kind of understanding of of you know Eileen Miles's work was that work was always a kind of valence of formation. So this working life is really powerful. And you know I'm also I, I'm also had the gift of learning how to be an artist in New York. So you know you're tough in New York. I mean people say things and you just feel how to you know it's a part of I'm of that generation 53. I came to New York at 22 in the 90s. So there's a very kind of way in which I'm also studying a lot of theory, hanging out a lot of regular people, and I knew the benefits of something. So I actually knew at an early age that nothing I made was ever bad or worth throwing away, but I didn't have to suffer from some idiot telling me having some itchy feeling or from some sort of fear of evaluation because I was training in the conditions under what the auspices of how to learn about textual scholarship under the scholar Speed Hill. So I was writing a critical edition of Yusuf, Yusuf Komunyaka, and I was asked two things. Has anyone written a dissertation on Yusuf Komunyaka? I said, oh, I'm, I've just collected all of this work. No, I don't know. Has anyone ever written a dissertation about your work? What's my response after I'm I'm hanging out and I'm already in 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 the constellation of these people? I'm like not yet, right? That's how affirmative action works. It fortifies the heart and the soul, so nothing I ever make can be. It's just work, you know. What I mean, people say things, people have bad days, but I don't have the same responses that Yusuf has had, that my fathers have had, that my peers have had. Because they grew up, I mean, it's, but it, this is all I'm saying. I'm just saying that's why it is only my position to be a moderate, or as I like to say, a compassionate conservative. Go Nancy. I'm just kidding, but I do like the Chanel. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's so wrong, right? But it's the channel I like. I know. It's Salty. Wrong. Yeah. Well, exactly. no, yeah, wrong is not my name, June Jordan. Of course, I knew that too, right? Yeah. So well, how could I ever think anything wrong? Next question. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering, kind of apropos of this conversation, how you guys have dealt with sort of the like petty disappointments that come with being an artist that can be so devastating, like exactly what you're saying, someone that you really respect comes and tears your work apart or you don't get the fellowship or you lose X competition. And do you feel like your reactions to those sort of disappointments has has changed over time and grown no <laughs> I mean I just feel like I'm always thinking oh I'm I'm me now I'm this and then something comes you know you apply for something and I think I, I'm just surely I'll get this because da, da, da. and then I get rejected and I'm just like floored and I'm like outraged and you know, I'm invited to apply for something. And I think invited to apply, sure, the American Academy in Rome. I thought, I'm invited to apply. I thought, how oh, cool. Look who I am. And then they were like, the jury felt, thank, very grateful to get your application. But they went with a, I was like, what? I mean, I indulged myself that time. And I wrote them and I told them how stupid I thought they were. Wow. I thought, I know oh, I'm just really? burning this bridge and I could it. give a fuck. I was so mad. Wow. <laughs> you know, go, I thought, go I'm go just going to do yeah. without this one. But also, you know, other times, you know, very, you know, very prestigious magazines have commissioned me to write pieces, and I thought, look at me now. Here I go. And they kill it. Mm -hmm. I write it. I get a big kill fee, and they, you know, so I just, and I still feel like it's about, I go to class. I thought I'm a dyke, a working class. I didn't go to the right schools. Mm -hmm. They hate me. I'm all, you know, and, I, and then it's just, but I would just think that, you know, after I have a little party for myself feeling bad, then I just realize I like making work more than anything else. You know, I like what I do. I feel good about what I do. People like my work. I'm happy that people read my work. You know what I mean? I just feel like the buoyancy of what is right, both the practice and the reception that does feel good, just overwhelms the negativity. But the neg I still feel like a little, you know, terrible person. And look at, look at, I'm still, I'm still an outsider. Yeah. And that just may be the quality of a career. It's just like yeah. we have all kinds of careers. Some people like yeah. really just go right in and it's theirs from the beginning. I had friends who got Guggenheims in the 80s and I had to apply 25 times. Mm -hmm. I got wow. mine 30 years later. Uh, we were the same age, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just like, what, that's the deal. That's my, that's just my story, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I have one that I still can't 
you know, the subway on 34th Street. I can't stop by it. I, I don't want to ever walk by an area because I was in a competition. I was invited, same thing. You know, I was, there were three people to go and do the interview and do a presentation to, so they can do, you know, those mirror walls. The, the and I didn't get it. I was pissed. I was, so, yeah, petty. I'm not stopping on 34th Street. I'm not walking by that area. Damn. I have to walk Salty. around the damn thing because I know that was my slot that I, I missed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so petty. Yeah. yeah. I know. There's a novel. Somebody wrote a novel called Eileen, and it came out at the same time as a book of mine, and she was getting so much more press. I have <laughs> never re read that writer. I was <laughs> <laughs> just like, one day perhaps I will. Yeah, I'm not go I'm not getting near that damn station. <laughs> I'm still pissed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an architecture to the kinds of rejections. I just assume rejection, right? Just in yeah. jump because, like, I, g you know, I refuse to read the book. I write the book. You know, I it, it has to do, I think, with the decision to 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 really go full forward into drawing and making because it forced me to get off all the medias, all the social medias, all the Insta, all the this, all the that, because it meant that I was feeling kind of some kind of way. Like, I'm competitive, right? I'm also jealous, so why would I need, and in fact, if I really need to hear the news, someone will send me the news. But that's the, that's the answer, but I mean, really, I can tell you the real answer why I really don't care. There's a difference when you're applying for an internal university research grant and it goes far, and it's not a small deal because you're fighting, you're, you're asking for a salary, right? And this is real numbers. So you're asking for awards of $400,000 a year through a, through, for, through a major university, which is supposed to cover two years of work. So you actually see the labor, and you're no longer writing it. You have to go through different university channels because it's a theoretical argument that needs to move gigantically. So you, everyone, there's so many people fighting for you, and, and then, then you get, so then I remember getting something like, it, in the end it wasn't even eligible. So who, who's reading all of this of, over all of the chain? I won the internal award, blah, blah, blah. And at that point I realized, wow, I did so much work and I had so much material. So I just applied for McDowell and then got McDowell, whatever. I had like something there, but really it's a matter of, and I, similar, th Syria, in, invitation, major, you know, literary, you know, anthology, literary thing. We really want the wild stuff. I'm like, do you really want the wild stuff? Several months, um, several months, I'm doing this, I'm like, I'm doing fine drawings from this beginning to the end, performance, also theory that undergirds this stuff. It's smart, it really is engaged with the subject, but I have six months, I'm doing one thing for you. And then the, the answer is, oh, we, we, we can't do this, which is fine, right? Because there's no room for it. Fine, so I just call my friend Duriel. I'm like, Duriel, yo, I got this piece. Duriel E. Harris, who's at Obsidian. I'm like, you know, I have this crazy terrain piece. I'm doing all this stuff. And then she looked at it, and then we just talked for a long time. She's like, wow, did they even read this? Did they look at it? Because I just really want to, and, and Tracy Morris, the great Tracy Morris poets, they were looking at it for a special issue on sound. I'm not salty or mad about anything because it's modular. Work is modular. You could just send it somewhere else. But I, but I do understand, again, I have the benefit of having a PhD in English from the CUNY Graduate Center. And so that gives me a certain kind of armature that I understand grants, I know how to write them, I know how to do them, but I also can write poetry. But I think that that means that, yeah, I feel some kind of way if I get something, but then, you know, whatever. It's just like you have this scrap of paper. Like the video didn't jump off. Fine, it's a quiet thing, it's a behind thing. So guess what we're talking about tomorrow in class? We're talking about what's behind us. The video that you can't see, it's, it's the, a part of how does it form into the pedagogical mode. And the last thing I'll say is, this is what I will write into my dossier when they ask about how do I teach. Hello, first sentence, this is my teaching philosophy. I present things behind me out of my control because my great friends are both itchy and throwing things away and they're letting these things happen to them. It's a problem. Act affirmatively right now or I will leave. Give me more. Hi, uh, beautiful, love having the energy of all your art. Uh, your voices, it's so needed, especially in Provincetown. I feel like this, you know, sorry to bring it just to this place, but P 
P-Town is a poem, a whole po This place is so poetic. You know, you were swimming, it's just, the, it's gonna rain later, it's gonna rain, it's just so awesome, you know? But there's a, and I don't mean to, you know, bring it, I'm not talking about politics, but I probably am, but like the gentrification of Provincetown, it's, it breaks my heart. You know, I can't go to the West End anymore. It's like, ugh, I only stay on the East End because I feel like uh, more comfortable the there. But I, and I, but that's whatever. If I fall in love in the West End, don't ask me later. But, but the, do, how, what do you, just for, I, I feel like an artist, like half of me, my friends, we don't have the confidence that you have. And I'm really inspired by the confidence that I see in artists like you. So just a quick little, you know, what, how do you get that, where do you get that confidence? For all of us? I think it's Eileen. Yeah, well yeah I, I just want to, just oh maybe God, two words. I, I, I think so. Let's play a game. Let's think who's the most confident. Oh I would, I think it's Eileen. I think Eileen. Right. This badass. Yeah, Eileen is yeah. a badass. I know I'm cool. Eileen is the. Eileen has a great <laughs> degree of it. No, I just I seriously believe that, but I don't say it in, in a way in any kind of. I'm gonna say I'm not putting anything on that. I'm just really I was I think about that, and I think that you know and I I think and again literary referent, you know Gwendolyn Brooks in in I think it might be report for part two or for report. I'm not for sure. We're well not sure which particular volume, but in the end, is it the first or second, where there are the book reviews, and there are these pithy book reviews. Is that part one or part two? No, I'm no, you are. Yes. Well, I'm meaning just in her introductions. Yes, in report from part one, it's, it's really strange. Yeah, but just that, thank you, you know, and just this idea of like, she says, so-and-so is a confident poet. That's all she says. And then that's it, that's the introduction. And you know, this is what one can say about, I believe one can say about an Eileen Miles in terms of the confident poet. It's like, that's all you actually need to say because it's a matter of understanding you know, the weight and direction of a kind of gravity, right? Like making the lead surfboard is an invitation to think about the silver surfer. And make and thinking about the silver surfer means that one, why not just go into the water and then decide how hungry you are? The you know, I know it's a problem in terms of gentrification, but they're also social, I mean, just like humanly, we have different relationships to gentrification. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to come here and say, you know, I'm not going to buzz. You know, I, you know, this is, I'm anti. Yo, I'm not wearing the short shorts and going to get the cock green up. Like, come on. I have the storm fashion here. You're 50 years old. You need to really, you know, like, it's like, it's like me. It's like over cleavaged. Stop it already. Not cute. That's a kind of form of, of gender. It's just all wrong. So just go away from that, which means go into the water. The only thing, just go into the na nature. Nature doesn't. So that's what I do in P-Town, because it's, it's mine as much as, you know, everyone else's. In, and with that is also all of the history of, you know, it's like Spike Lee was just talking about DeSantis, and he was like, yeah, I talk to my wife a, a lot, and she's like, you know, I keep going back to this. And it was like a confident moment that a major American filmmaker was, artist said, like, we're on land, stolen land, and we brought stolen people here. So you can't talk to me about gentrification with that, without that as a kind of, like that's a force field of just rational knowledge for me. So I'm just looking for the best like burgundy that echoes the tone of a California Chardonnay that's just cool enough so that I can add the single ice cube and then decide whether or not I want the oysters here or wait till I fly to Oyster forward, gentrify it, do it in org. Do your work, white people, because I need to wear my white pants and get them, or whatever. Make it work. Make it exquisite, because I need fine food. So if so, it, you, I don't care where it is. Gentrifier, get me to your place. It's like a Trump rally. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was all wrong. Sorry, I was saying.
I just, I, I always think of the quote though, like um, um, confidence is related to the amount of redundancy in the message, mm -hmm. right? Was it Frederick Jameson? And it's just like, uh, I think everything that, that looks confident is about just having done the same thing for a year. You know, everything I was, you know, the thing in that essay that I was reading mm -hmm. is, is really about this idea that, that, you know, you come back, things come around and you come back around and you, like this, this, yes. this new book is an old book. I feel like it's yes. so amazing when I'm, I'm really excited about my new work because it, it really is that I feel like I've been doing the same thing for so long that it's not that I'm um, doing it again, but it, I kind of am, but I'm somebody else doing it. And so it just feels deep. And it's just like, I feel like I can't be knocked off a podium because I belong there. No, it's transcendent. Because I've been doing it for so long. It's, but there's it's something more, Eileen, in terms of confidence. There's something in particular around, you know, you're intervening and the two of you are intervening through the kind of the urgencies, right? So I don't know, is it Keats who's ever negative capability? You're doing negative possibility. And that is a kind of, you know, what we may call queer optimism, but that is an aggressive, maximalist, forward approach to territory. You know what I mean? Like this one takes up a lot of space and works in sheeny, shiny materials. This one here is working into she's all over this book. So mourning becomes a surface and resin. And that's very different than repetition. That's layering. And composition and layering is something that black and brown, I don't know where you came from, but when I heard ocean, I heard Oshun. You know what I'm saying? And that is something that you're touching the inside. It's like, to me, it's, a, it's like, why Janis Joplin? Can Janis Joplin contain or hold that soul? Guess who could? The Beatles. Guess why? Because there's four of them, and they're not from America. Blackbird singing in the back. Ah, take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. Why? Because that melody is ancient. They're listening to black music. George Michael, listening to black music. You're, listen you're cool with black people because it's like when I met you, I was like, okay, she's kind of right. I'm working here. I'm serving chicken. I, it, it made me understand. But then this working life is what we have to do. It is what we have to do. And it's, if it's what we have to do and we accept it, I think that that is a kind of relationship to, you know, in Fred's work, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in, um, in Tom, did I call you Fred like nine times? Yes. <laughs> but which it's an Fred? Asian thing. Which Fred? That's no, this is a problem. I just caught that I did that. No, because I was thinking, I was, I, was, I was lumping you together with, with Fred because you, you look similar. <laughs> I look like Fred. You look like Fred. I'm well, I look like Fred. I'll tell you the truth of why I made that mistake, Tomas. I'm going to tell you why. Because it wasn't a matter of like making the mistake. And it's not an apology. I'm just telling you. I know I'm, but I caught myself. But it's because what happens when you're working in printmaking is the indelible, the image is so deep in your brain when you're working in prints. And that, that pattern or print, I just saw like a different version. And also to see another printmaker. So I actually saw the art more than the person until this very moment, right? I mean, are you gonna, so yeah, and I don't know, I mean, that's messed up, but at the same time, there's something tricky about catching it. Any, any more questions? <laughs> Let's move on. Is that wrong? <laughs> Why did I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. did I mess up in Thomas Thomas? What, did I mess up? Remember, thank you everyone. Remember that Eileen and Ronaldo will be signing books in the back. And come back tomorrow when we're going to hear from photographer Rashad Taylor and Sarah Schulman. Come back tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.